Namaste, and welcome to another episode of Yoga Vasishta. Today we're going to look into Rama's questions. This is at the end of his monologue, which occupies most of the first book of Yoga Vasishta. Here he sums up his whole argument, and he puts it in the form of questions to Vasishta. And these questions are really wonderful. They're really excellent. They are the questions, <laughs> the important questions of human life. So if we want to live successfully and attain the goal of enlightenment, and we should pay very close attention to these questions because they abound in clues that if we follow up, we can make tremendous advancement and progress in life. So let's take a look at Rama's questions. What state of life is dignified above others, which is not associated with troubles, is unqualified by the human condition, free from errors, where grief is unknown. Now, this all by itself is just the most important question one can ask. How can we get to that state of being, huh, which is most dignified, full of knowledge, but without troubles? This is what everybody wants to know, isn't it? And every scheme proposed by scientists, politicians, and so on and so forth, religionists and everybody, is really trying to find out this state. How can we solve all our problems? How can we be free from suffering? So Rama is asking the first question, it's the biggest question possible. If one simply stands in this question, the answers will come. Try it. Sit down and meditate on this question. What is the ideal state of human life which is free from the suffering of the human condition? Just meditate on that for a while and see what happens. Next. How have Janaka and other good men, conspicuous for their ceremonious acts and distinguished for their good conduct, acquired their excellence? Really, how to do it? Janaka, that's Sita's father, who would later become Rama's father-in-law, was well known as a jnani. He had attained after enjoying in the royal harem. And he heard the speech of the siddhas flying in the air. And what they said so disturbed him that he retired from active life into meditation for a long time until he achieved it. So we want to know, how did he do it? How can a man who has smeared the dirt of worldliness all over his body be cleansed? All of us in this life are contaminated with worldliness. And what is worldliness, really? It's thinking that this world is real, that it's solid, that it's a permanent place, that it's consistent, and that we can attain happiness here by chasing our desires. None of those ideas are correct. <laughs> Actually, this world is a dream. It's transient. It's unreal. It's not solid at all. It's infinitely changeable and completely unreliable and unpredictable. So anyone who is trying to gain happiness here 
is in for a big surprise. I think you all know this already. What is the knowledge by which the serpents of worldliness can be freed from their worldly crookedness and become straight in their conduct? Well, that would be some powerful knowledge indeed. How can you take worldliness, which is inherently crooked? The whole world is based on a lie. So how to make it straight? That would be some mighty powerful knowledge. And of course, the answer is abstraction, renunciation, detachment, and realization of the absolute. How can the foulness of my heart, soiled by errors and tainted with evils like a lake disturbed by elephants and polluted with dirt, regain its clarity? We've all become damaged goods because of the actions of this world. And really, it's our own fault because we came here chasing happiness trying to find the results of our desires. And that's just the wrong way to approach this world. Uh, we hurt ourselves like someone who runs into a wall repeatedly. <laughs> it's simply not possible to gain full, unremitting and permanent happiness in this world. Once we accept that, then the door to real happiness will open. How is it possible for someone engaged in worldly affairs to be untainted with their blemishes and remain as pure and intact as a drop of water on a lotus leaf? Huh? How can we be in the world but not of the world. How can we remain pure? And of course, the actual solution to this is to have our main presence outside of this world, in Brahman, in God, in the absolute, the unchangeable oneness, and simply come to this world if we come here at all as a visitor, as a guest, and not as a permanent resident. That's how we retain our innocence and purity. How can one attain excellence by dealing with others as with himself, regarding others' property to be like straw and remaining aloof from love? Jesus said this in the Bible, one should love others as oneself, isn't it? This is the standard of holy conduct. So how can we consider others' property to be like straw? Only if we're devoid of jealousy and envy. Only if we have no need to compare ourselves with others only if we are free from desire and the need to own things, to possess and to enjoy. So innocence leads to correct conduct in the world. Freedom from desire means freedom from sin. And finally, when he says remaining aloof from love, the word used is kama, which actually means lust. There are many different words for love in Sanskrit. Unlike English, <laughs> there are actually more than a hundred different words. So here he's specifically talking about lust or using people for sense enjoyment. How can we remain apart from that? Who is that great man that has crossed the great ocean of the world, 
whose exemplary conduct exempts one from misery. Who is that person? Well, he is the jnani. He is the realized being. He is the guru. He is the self in human form. When one realizes the self or Brahman, then he is no longer speaking or acting as a human. He has become a mouthpiece for the divine. The body has been given up in the service of God. And then God speaks and acts through it transparently. What is the best of things that should be pursued and what fruit is worth obtaining? There are many objects that people pursue in this world. So our valuable human life will be wasted unless we find the best of these objects huh? that will give us really what we're looking for, which is happiness. Most of the fruits of our activities are at best mixed. There's some happiness, there's some pleasure, some satisfaction, but it's always mixed with displeasure, dissatisfaction and suffering, isn't it? There's nothing perfect in this world. As Bhagavad Gita says, all endeavors are covered by some fault. That's just the way it is here. That means the real fruit that is worth obtaining is release from this world, liberation from birth and death, enlightenment and knowing the real truth. Which is the best course of life in this inconsistent world? We want to make plans. We want to set a course. We want to find our bearings and know where we're at. We want situational awareness. Huh? And what is our condition? And where are we in respect to our goal? So what is the best course to set? Because this world is so inconsistent. There is no landmarks. There's no bearings. There's no frame of reference that will give us a, a means of navigating across this ocean of life. We have to find a goal that is beyond. Just like if we have a magnetic compass, then no matter whether the sun rises or sets or the moon or stars are visible or not, we always know where north is and we can always navigate that is Brahman, that is the self, that is self-realization and enlightenment. How can I have knowledge of past and future events of the world and the nature of the unsteady works of its creator, that my mind may be cleared of impurities? Well, of course, we don't really have knowledge of the past because time for one thing, always destroys it. And for another thing, there's a lot of propaganda in history and things that happened that were not pleasing to the current authorities are routinely erased from our historical records. So we don't have real knowledge of the past. And as far as the future, well, who knows? <laughs> but these things are knowable. They can be known through the scriptures, which are written or revealed by beings on a higher level of existence, a higher level of consciousness, who can see the past and future directly. And that will give us an idea, at least the general direction of from where things came and where they're going. What is most delectable to the mind and what is the most abominable? And how may this fickle and inconstant mind become fixed like a rock? In other words, 
We don't know, really, what is the most pleasing thing. Maybe it's something we haven't experienced yet. Nor do we know, really, what is the most detestable, what is the most painful, the most displeasing thing. Because it's outside our experience, thank goodness. <laughs> but these things also can be known by, again, by the revelations of the great souls, the great beings. And finally, the million dollar question, how can we still this mind? How can we achieve peace of mind, even in this ever-changing world, and even considering the nature of the mind to be so unstable? That's the yoga process. What is that holy charm that can remove this choleric pain of worldliness attended with numberless troubles? If we only knew the answer to this, huh? What is the medicine for suffering? What is the cure for all these worldly troubles? He says the holy charm. If it was only so easy, huh? To just wear a charm around your neck or somewhere and that would keep away all troubles of this world. But actually there is such a thing but it's not so simple as just putting on a necklace <laughs> with some herbs or writing on it. That is the process of yoga. And it is something that ordinarily takes many years or many lifetimes. And it's absolutely the necessity for real human life. And finally, how can I entertain the blossoms of the tree of heavenly happiness that sheds the coolness of full moonbeams within my heart? In other words, what is the secret of bliss? So we'll be looking into all these questions and their answers in Yoga Vasishta. And you'll be amazed at the information that's revealed in the succeeding books. So there are more questions, however, and we're going to deal with those in the next part. Meanwhile, some food for thought. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam